Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today we have a very special treat. We have Ellen Kearney presenting from Forrester's Research. Ellen is a very close friend of our agency and a very close friend of the insurance industry. I've had the pleasure to be able to hear her and also work alongside with her out in Arizona just about a month, month and a half ago. And she's going to be presenting a lot of the content that she had presented there. And I will tell you, you're in for a treat when it comes to the customer experience and customer service. And there's an awful lot of statistics that she's going to share with us. I can promise you it's going to be an hour packed with content that every agency uh, is going to have takeaways. So without further ado, Ellen, I don't want to hold you up. We're ready for you to take over. Well, Chris, thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for taking a little time out of your lunch hour and your Thursday afternoon um, to uh, kind of listen in on, on the research that I've been doing around the role of the agent. And just to kind of start it off, Forrester Research, let me move forward here to I do my little Forrester commercial, if I can get my advance button to move. Okay, that should do it. So let me tell you a little bit about Forrester. <clears throat> We're a market research and consulting company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We've been in business for over 30 years. We have offices around the world. And we help clients uh, basically uh, um, better meet the expectations of their customers. And one of the ways we do that is by um, doing lots of surveys of businesses and consumers. So every year we are collecting um, information from you know over a half million um, or 500 yeah five yeah half million 500,000 <coughs> survey responses from both business leaders and consumers about how they feel about uh, interacting with vendors uh, you know uh, their banks their insurance companies um, how they feel about those experiences what their expectations are things like that and so <coughs> we produce um, syndicated research uh, that kind of details that and one of the things I've been working on um, as the uh, person covering the insurance industry here at Forrester is we had a great perspective of what consumers thought about <coughs> interacting with their insurance companies we were even collecting information about how they felt about their agents what we didn't have and this is where Chris helped me was a perspective of what was going on in the minds of the agents since many carriers actually think their agents are really the customer so we decided to rectify that last year and we've been <coughs> excuse me for my seasonal allergies so we did a survey of about 320 um, different roles within uh, independent agencies, mostly in the U.S., you know, two in Canada, and, we, and uh, you're going to see some of that data today. And I'm just finishing up a report on what the future holds for the independent agent, um, and uh, you know, basically what this is, you know, what we're going to be covering today. And then um, when we finish up today, uh, you know, I want to make a pitch for hopefully getting you guys. To participate in the 2016 survey where we're going to and I can talk a little bit about you know what we'll be covering in that particular survey but I'm sure you'll be um, when I describe it you'll be interested in chiming in <clears throat> so with the forced commercial and the background set I'm going to move us forward here not that long ago technology favored institutions uh, uh, you know, uh, in the in the early days when we were as an industry actually further ahead from a technology standpoint, thank you mainframe computers in the 60s and 70s, <coughs> all the information, all the power of information was in the hands of institutions like banks and insurance companies, and you know consumers were really dependent on the their insurers or their banks or their retailers actually to, to kind of disclose that information. And of course, this was like a you know, this was, you know, corporate secrets. Well, things are different now. And I, was, I suspect as you guys sit and look around your desks at lunch today <clears throat> and maybe even look at your wrists and see a, you know, a Fitbit or something like that there, you've got a mobile phone, you've got a tablet. So technology has really shifted the balance of power to the consumer. And um, honestly, because of those handy mobile devices, the consumers are collecting all kinds of information, not just about what Forrester measures, what they think, but more importantly, what they do, how they behave. Uh, you know, put it, let's put it in an insurance context. How, um, how often do they lock their door um, when they leave the house? How often do they set their alarm? How often do they go over 80 miles an hour when they're driving their car with that handy little telematics device in there? So <clears throat> as a result of, you know, mobile devices, 
and that includes the sensors uh, in wearables and Internet of Things, consumers have a lot more power over the information. And <clears throat> guess what? Insurance companies and banks want that. So we've shifted into this new age. Think back to the era of Henry Ford where he was able to mass manufacture um, vehicles, yes, any color as long as it's black, but he was also able in that mass manufacturing process to, to, to make it affordable so his workers could buy them. Come the 1960s, <clears throat> we had to be able to distribute all that stuff we were manufacturing, so we got really good as, as businesses at distributing um, the stuff that we produced. And then come the 1990s, where many of us kind of grew up and, you know, in the business world, became the age of information. You know, we were, you know, originally kind of trotting around floppy disks and stuff like that and passing them within the office. <coughs> and then we, in, you know, developed local area networks and wide area networks and now, of course, Wi-Fi that it lets us be connected anywhere. So, you know, we were designed as, a, as an insurance industry for su success in this connected PC internet world. Yet, unfortunately, you know, in the age of the customer, you know, the empowered buyers that I just talked a little bit about you know, are now expecting new um, new services, new kinds of uh, ways that they can interact with us, many of which, you know, we're not prepared to be able to deliver. So this digital, the digital world that we're all living in <coughs> is driving the power shift clearly, as I described, in the hands of the customers. And of course, because of the mobile trend, um, as I said, you, you know, many of you probably have multiple devices surrounding you as you listen to this webinar today you know, device adoption is growing. So when we first forecast uh, tablet usage back in 2012, by 2017 we were expecting fourfold increase in mobile, you know, tablet adoption. Smartphone, same year, 2012, you know, we were expecting basically a doubling of smartphone users. And, you know, that growth rate is only going to continue to accelerate as, as we become more mobile dependent. And for many of us here in, in <clears throat> the Western world, you know, we have more mobile subscriptions than we actually have population. So, you know, there are more of us, you know, with a, a mobile subscription and, of course, multiple mobile devices. And, of course, this mobile trend <coughs> is fueling um, ever-heightening customer expectations. So in our surveys here at Forrester, you know, uh, when we ask customers uh, or, or, or consumers what they expect in a company uh, uh, that's offering a solution on their on their smartphone. 62% say I want that, mo that you know the carrier or the banks or the retailer's website to be mobile friendly. I want to be able to use <clears throat> the browser on my mobile device and not having have to pinch and zoom. And I have a great experience. So if I want to buy insurance, it's really easy for me to do it. I want a mobile app to service my account once I become a customer. So I want to be, you know, 42% of, um, of users said I need to have a mobile app uh, for servicing. And then 23% said not only do I want the mobile app and, a, and an easy to use uh, mobile friendly website, I want you to be smart enough to know where I am and just serve me up content <clears throat> that's specific to the location that I'm in. And just as an example, you know, if I'm, uh, you know, using an agent locator on a carrier's website, it's not very helpful for me to have, point me, to, to have it point me to the nearest agent that's 1,400 miles away, even though that might be a great agent. So, you know, help, help me understand where I am <coughs> and serve me up the content that's appropriate for me in my location. So, again, consumers are expecting more and more from us as insurance carriers. And, of course, <coughs> this new expectation is changing the dynamics of the market. And, of course, what it takes for all of us, uh, including our carrier partners, to remain competitive. So from a market perspective, I've talked already about what customers expect. And, of course, <clears throat> from a channel perspective, not only do they expect to you know, uh, be able to interact on that mobile device, that's not the only channel they want to be able to interact with. So they might start that claim or start that quote for insurance on a tablet or, a, or, or their smartphones. But guess what? For you guys as agents, they want you to be able to pick up the ball and continue that fantastic experience that might have started on that smartphone and you know be all you know all hipped into you know what the customer is looking for maybe where they might stand in terms of their first notice of loss process and of course you know because these expectations may not be as easily fulfilled by our traditional insurance carriers this 
is opening up the door for all kinds of cool competitors. Um, I'm just in the midst of um, doing the vision report, so I'm basically laying out what's going to happen in the business of insurance for the next 10 years from a digital perspective, and we're talking to some of these disruptors, and all I can say is, are inspiring. You know, some of the most memorable conversations in the 15 years I've been an analyst. So, new competitors. It also affects, obviously, our operations. So, uh, you know, if, you know, I, I don't know if there's any carriers in the audience, but, you know, for a carrier, it's going to influence the kinds of products that we're able to create. And we're going to look at some examples of those. It's also going to be able to, as I said, not, you know, not only do we, are we able to collect information from a survey about what, cons what, what consumers think, Thank you, mobile devices. We're actually able to understand how they behave. So a lot more insights <coughs> about what our customers are doing. And then we can, of course, turn those insights into important um, bits of information to help us make better business decisions. Um, our employees, you know, in the survey of our uh, agents that we did last year, there were, a, you know, the number of people uh, within the agency community that were checking their mobile phones between 25 and 50 percent uh, during the uh, 25 and 50 times during the course of the day was over half the group. We actually even had a couple of people who were checking their mobile devices 150 times during the course of the day. So the, either they were incredibly busy <coughs> um, producers that uh, you know were in the million dollar club or something like that, or maybe they were shopping for Christmas. Um, so you know, obviously, uh, you know that digital connectivity um, and what that means for um, our staff is also really important. And finally, from a standpoint, all of you are expected to do more with the same um, amount of resources within your agencies. But mobile devices, um, you know, let you be more productive, <coughs> as well as uh, you know, great digital sites during the course of your day. So, you know, you could grow your agency's book of business, you could do more renewals, you can bring in new, more new business <coughs> with the same amount of resources. So, you know, big improvement there in our business operations. All of this matters because now our customers expect wherever, whenever, and however, they want immediate um, access to their banks, their insurance companies, their airlines, their retailers, whoever it happens to be. They also want the experience to be incredibly simple. No longer is it good enough to be sitting there on your smartphone typing in tons of information. We want to be able to speak into it. We want to be able to swipe it. We want to be able to tap on pictures. That's the kind of stuff we want to be able to do in terms of simplified input of the experience. And again, great example, we'll look at this a little bit later on, is um, Insurify. <coughs> you take a picture of your license plate, get a quote for auto insurance. And then finally, I talked a little bit about that kind of location-based stuff the context. You know, does it help, <clears throat> um, as I said, you know, to present information about an agent who might be 1,400 miles away? That's not going to be terribly useful for the customer. So this idea of context is getting really, really interesting. So, you know, imagine an experience where the insurance carrier, for instance, is not so much chiding the customer on safe driving skills and stuff like that, <clears throat> but maybe looking at it from the overall transportation. We're going to give you the most enjoyable way to take your multimodal commute into work. So, you know, think about that, what that might mean from a road standpoint, from a parking standpoint, from a commuter rail or a bus standpoint, maybe even the walking path as well. All of this translates into incredible convenience for the customer. And that, of course, <clears throat> you know, boils down to the fact that technology is changing our consumer expectations. So, think back to, you know, uh, you know, probably in the 1930s here, National Grange Mutual. You know, consumers, if they had questions, <coughs> excuse me, they couldn't get reach their, um, you know, their agents. You know, the, you know, the home office staff at here at National Grange Mutual in Keene, New Hampshire, would take care of that. They type it up, they'd send it out, and it might be a couple of weeks before the consumer got a, you know, got an answer to their question about their insurance coverage. Think about it now. Um, you know, this is a sad picture of a Lamborghini that's been totaled, and the guy is hanging out of the window, and I don't know if you can see it, but he's tapping something 
on a mobile device. Maybe he's calling 911. Maybe he's letting someone know that he's going to be late for dinner. Maybe he's doing first notice a loss of this very significant claim. So, you know, this whole idea of technology changing customer expectations, this is probably one of the most vivid images of how that's changed, how we um, have to interact with our, our customer base. So, welcome to the age of the customer. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of set up the context of what this all, what this was, but it's a 20-year business cycle in which successful businesses are going to be the ones that are going to transform themselves to be systematically understanding and serving these customers who are empowered by mobile devices, wearables, Internet of Things, um, to, you know, to you know, and all of this stuff is heightening their expectations and putting more demands on us as insurance agents and, of course, our carrier partners. So. Uh, you know, now we're going to get into some of the fun data stuff. Um, and regardless of what you think, most American consumers buy their insurance from agents, not from comparison sites. So in a survey that we did last year of 10,000 Americans, 81% said they bought their car insurance through an agent, not through a comparison site. Only 3% had done that. 83% said they bought their homeowner's insurance through an agent versus 2% from a comparison site. And of course, because we know consumers here, at least here in the US, um, you know, just uh, only half of them buy any kind of life insurance. 56% said they actually bought it, um, you know, through an agent. Uh, of course, no surprise, a lot of the rest of it was through the workplace. Uh, and that's, of course, versus 2% of comparison site. Now, interestingly, you know, even though they might not have you know, purchased it from a comparison site, 6% of Americans start their journey um, for shopping for auto insurance on a comparison site. Now, interestingly, in the UK, it's about 47%. So obviously market structure is a little bit different there and they've been, you know, the aggregators have, um, you know, been working hard in the British market for 16, 17 years. This is only something that's, you know, relatively recent in the U.S. market. You know, there was a crack at it back in the early aught aughts 2000s and it's, uh, you know, since, um, you know, picking up steam again um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about Google Compare later, but, um, you know, a lot of Americans are starting their, at least right now, their journeys on those websites. So it'll be interesting to see how many of them actually, uh, you know, kind of increase that buying behavior as, you know, the, um, as some of the online agents like uh, Answer Financial, Coverhound, those guys, you know, get more adept at uh, some of the digital experiences that they're delivering. So top research choice for insurance shoppers, they want to talk to you guys. So when we asked consumers how they uh, research, did the research for, you know, for buying um, you know, homeowners, renters, auto insurance, and life insurance, this is what we saw. And you can see I tried to bold and these are a little bit text dense, but, you know, basically people pick up the phone or go to meet with an agent or advisor. So top choice, you know, for homeowners, I, I spoke to an agent or an advisor on the phone. 21% said I met with them. Um, you know, when it came to renter's insurance, I spoke with an agent or an advisor on the phone. And that's actually striking because, you know, who are the big rent buyers, yeah, uh, rental insurance buyers? Millennials. Um, homeowner, excuse me, auto insurance are, are, are orange backs. I talked to an agent or advisor on the phone. Uh, here, you know, we we see probably some of the, you know, 22% said I, you know, poked around on the on the provider's website, um, and 22% said, yeah, I depend on, um, you know, friends and family when I, you know, talked about who who they use for auto insurance. And then when it comes to life insurance, and this is, uh, you know, pretty close, you know, I met with or spoke with um, an, an agent or advisor on the phone. So a quarter of the respondents basically said, you know, it was a human-to-human -human kind of contact that I had when I was buying much of this coverage here. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is always really fun. 12.9. 12.5, 16.3, and 8. What's this? How long we stick with our auto insurers, our homeowners insurers, our life insurers, and the spouse in the average U.S. marriage that ends in divorce. We stick longer with our agents oftentimes than we do with, um, you know, you know, the, the people that we expected to be living the rest of our lives with. So we have very, very enduring relationships with our 
are insurance agents. <clears throat> and, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what some of the reasons are for that in a little bit later on. Um, but, you know, just to, you know, so, you know, here it is, you know, uh, uh, loved one versus our insurance agent. <clears throat> when we asked, you know, how likely would you be to consider switching companies if a friend or family member recommended another company? We saw in that earlier slide with my little, my little rounded maxes, uh, um, you know, friend or family, this is, this is part of the research process. So in Canada, 26% said, yeah, I'd switch. 19% in the U.S., I'd switch. How about my agent? So we see a big bump up in terms of the influence that an agent has when it comes to recommending a different company. And of course, we all know what this is, remarketing. <clears throat> the whole idea here is, you know, the agent's going to recommend a different company because, you know, they're going to be doing something better for the consumer. You're going to save uh, sort of like my own agent did for me last year when they saved me $1,100 on my homeowner's insurance. That was music to my ears. So, you know, I, you know, anything like that really drives loyalty <coughs> for our agents. Now, this is another interesting one. The two things that the greatest number of younger millennials, so these are the ones 18 to 24 years old, what have they done on their, with their insurance carriers on a mobile phone in the last 90 days? Um, I, I wish I was all in front of you because we always have a fun time with this one. Finding a local agent and buying coverage. So my question for you guys, <clears throat> how good is your website? Do you have a mobile app? Um, you know, is a millennial, a first time buyer, the, you know, and that moment where you have the opportunity to build that kind of loyalty I had talked about on the, you know, the, the duration of the relationships that we have with our life insurers and our auto insurers and our homeowners insurance. So, you know, um, think about what am I doing to attract this audience and how, uh, you know, are my producers going to pay attention to, you know, a first time um, auto insurance buyer who might show up in a beater car. But this is the moment that you have to, to um, create the moment of loyalty um, with a first time insurance buyer. Now, I hate to tell you, when they get smart about insurance, the 25 to 34 uh, year old group, we see that, you know, looking for an agent on the mobile phone drops off dramatically because they're smart about insurance. But, you know, key takeaway, you know, pay attention to those first time buyers. And why are they turning to their agents and advisors? Why, what, what, what's prompting them to pick up the phone or look for one? So when we asked, um, uh, 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 about, let's see, I think this population, oh, this was actually pretty a pretty big one. This was uh, 35,000 U.S. online adults um, earlier this year. What did they want to get from their agents? And when it came to things like investment accounts, that's my little dollar bill there, um, they were looking for information about what kinds of assets that you, I mean, investments that you have that could align with my financial goals. So 56% said that was, you know, was, was what they were looking for. Others, 51% said, I want to understand how this investment account would fit into my financial plan. And then, you know, about 50% said, you know, give me the best um, option advice for my needs. And of course, we're going to see a lot more attention on this. Thank you, DOL fiduciary role. Um, and how about for auto insurance? You know, again, people are looking for, tell me what's covered by the insurance. That's, you know, even though we all have to have auto insurance, we can't understand the language. We don't know what the right amount of coverage is. So agent, help me. 51% wanted to understand what kinds of options were available to me, you know, maybe, you know, usage-based insurance or low mileage or whatever it happens to be, but, you know, tell me what my choices are. And finally, others, you know, nearly 50%, 48% wanted information about what my other, you know, kinds of options might be available to them as well, say roadside assistance or, you know, maybe a homeowner's coverage that would include maybe um, identity theft protection or something like that. So that's what consumers are looking for from agents. And interestingly, um, when it came to investments versus vehicle coverage, and, I, and again, the reason why I included the investments, because I know some of you may very well be, you know, you know um, uh, selling life insurance. So I thought it would be worth taking a look here. So when it came to, um, you know, the, the, the the planning horizon for applying for this most recent product that they bought within the last year, 19% um, of uh, investment buyers uh, said it was within the month, 19% said it was in the day, 
And then scarily, we had 17% uh, said it was a few minutes before I opened or applied for it. So there was a lot of spur of the moment there, a surprising amount of spur of the moment. So compared to our, our you know, our auto insurance buyers who were a little bit more considered, you know, you know, within a week, 27%. And of course, I think we saw a lot more of this, uh, you know, thank you, um, high cost of cheap gas, um, you know, when auto claims and rate increases this year. 23% uh, said within the month, 22% uh, said within the day, and then within three months, and you know, 13%. Uh, so a little bit more considered buying, um, which was a little bit more surprising uh, compared to investments accounts. I wouldn't have figured that one. But we do have a bit of a big problem here. Um, and uh, you know, Chris has seen a bit uh, longer version of this slide, but um, when we asked consumers about what you know how they felt about their agents you know many of them really trusted them you know uh, you know they were available to them they, they were helpful in answering questions but we asked a question about um, how well they did in terms of qualifying the consumers needs before making a product suggestion and how regularly they communicated with me and as you can see here this is a little bit alarming so life insurance, yeah, I get this. You know, ask me about my needs. Want to understand what my, you know, you know what my retirement goals are, or something like that. You know, do I have, you know, bigger assets to protect? Sixty-four percent said, you know, a life insurance customer said this is in fact what happened. Only fifty-five percent of say PNC non-life customers said my ask, agent asked me about my needs before suggesting a product. So what could they be doing? Maybe just taking an order. And you know, keep in mind, you know, young, you know, millennials. That's what they're looking for. Ask me about my needs. Help me understand. Educate me about the value of insurance before you actually try and pitch me something. And then, um, even more sadly, here, my agent communicates with me regularly. Fifty-two percent of life customers, you know, said that in fact happens. And and, and what what are those communications? Probably statements. So this might be, you know, an understanding of how an annuity might have performed or, or something like that. You know, and a lot of this, you know, is, is regular communications, you know, air, imagine air quotes around this, is <clears throat> um, communications that come to us in the mail because, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, we're required to send them. The scary thing. 42% said of non-life customers, so, you know, basically PNC, you know, us as personal line sellers, you know, 42% said my agent communicates with me regularly. Um, so what does that mean? There's a lot of opportunity uh, to open the door for new competitors who might c communicate more regularly with our customers. So this is a huge problem. So I just want to remind you, 51% of vehicle insurance shoppers say that the reason they wanted to work with an agent was so they could understand what insurance options were available. And yet, we're, we're clearly here um, not meeting the needs of our customers. So, you know, they, this is what they want, and then this is how many think this is what's happening when they have these conversations with their life insurance agents or advisors and their property casualty <coughs> agents. So. This should not come as a surprise. So uh, let me describe what this is. We asked how satisfied consumers were, and this survey was a little bit smaller. This is about 4,500 uh, online Americans back in 2015. <clears throat> um, when it came to using each channel to interact with their insurance company, so the call center over the phone with a live person, by mail, so snail mail, online, in person, walk into the agency, on a tablet, you know, an IVR, and then finally on a mobile phone. And take a look at the box that I've highlighted here. Um, when you look at on, online, by mail, and in person, gosh, they're pretty darn close, aren't they? They're all kind of clustered together. We do see a little bit of a difference <coughs> um, in the life insurance space, but boy, it's pretty darn close for property and casualty. Uh, or you know for auto and home and the troubling part about this is is that you know for an insurance carrier by mail is cheap to serve online is even cheaper um, fractions of a cent a cent you know for the interaction in person that's the highest cost channel so <clears throat> for the interactions that consumers are having with all of you um, this represents a big cost and yet what we're delivering is only as satisfying as you know something that you know allows basically very little interaction. So um, I didn't include this slide here, but 
when I did a comparison of how these different channels performed across a variety of industries, and if anybody's interested in it, just <coughs> excuse me, leave me your email address, um, and I'll send it to you. But believe it or not, the government did better than insurance companies. So a little bit scary that we are not doing so well in meeting the needs of our customers in terms of these in-person interactions. And again, this is this is what makes us human. This is why we should be doing a much better job. And maybe this is because we have a little bit of trust disconnect. <clears throat> so we asked two questions last year when we were doing this survey of agents and consumers, and we flipped the questions around. How many agents believed that their customers trusted the agent trusted them more than the than the than the carrier? Ninety one percent. The number of consumers that agreed with that statement, thirty one percent. So I got some bad news for us. We're thinking we're doing a better job than we really are. So, you know, we think we're doing a good job. We think, <clears throat> you know, because, you know, we see them at the grocery store or church or the soccer game and we can say hi and we can at least maybe even recognize them as our customers, that that's enough. <clears throat> but, you know, in, in fact, consumers feel very, very differently. So there is a huge trust disconnect here <clears throat> between what you guys believe and what your customers think. So. The question is, are you ready to meet the new expectations of your customer? So I talked a little bit about, you know, in this age of the customer, they want you to be able to provide any kind of information <clears throat> or service on any kind of device whenever, wherever they need it. And that might be outside your agency hours. It may be on Sunday. It may be on Christmas Day. So are you going to be ready to be able to meet these kind of expectations? And <laughs> you may laugh, <clears throat> but I have a great example of an agency uh, a, a larger agency in the in in the Bay Area of California <clears throat> that is able to do that, and I can t describe a little bit about them. Uh, ABD Insurance and Financial Services, but when you have a customer base that includes Twitter and Facebook and um, uh, Yelp and Yahoo, you know there's just higher expectations about what you're able to do with your customers from a digital um, standpoint. So let's take a look in terms of what carriers are saying when it comes to their priorities, um, and it'd be interesting to hear if you agree with this as well. <clears throat> so when we asked carriers last year, and again you can see how many 265 carriers, um, and, you know, versus uh, you know about uh, 7,200 um, uh, industries outside of insurance. So I wanted to point out here the differences between insurance and then all other industries besides insurance, and you know. Insurance has absolutely over-indexed, as you can see in my green uh, bold here, when it comes to wanting to improve the experiences of our customers. So the thing that the industry has lagged on, um, you know, we've been following what the bankers and the retailers and the travel um, companies have been doing, <clears throat> and, you know, in the threat of disruption, which, believe it or not, is really real right now, um, you know, there's a lot more attention on really understanding the journeys that customers take when they engage with with the carriers and oh by the way understanding the journeys that they're taking when they're engaging with their agents and, and, and I gotta also chime in there's a ton of interest um, amongst the carriers right now too about your journeys as agents <clears throat> when you um, you know opt to work with one carrier over another so we can talk a little bit about some of those things as well so I'm not sure if this is a surprise to you, but um, you know the good news is insurance organizations are are paying attention to customer experience, and they're turning to digital to drive those customer experiences uh, for consumers. So. Um, just to give you a sense here, uh, you know, the top four versus the bottom four <coughs> of initiatives. So when we asked uh, what firm, you know, what carriers were doing to improve customer experience, you know, 66% were going to improve the online customer experience. So when they come to our, you know, you know, come to our website through a browser, um, you know, maybe it's on the mobile phone, maybe it's on a desktop, we're making it, making that really simple. We're making it perform really well. Um, you know, so many people, obviously, as we saw in that earlier slide in terms of, you know, how you were doing your research, people are picking up the phone and calling people in the call center. So, you know, we want to make sure that's a great experience. And, you know, to the point I made, you know, if you started, uh, you know, an application or a claim in some other 
you know, the call center agent should be able to pick up the ball when you pick up the phone and call them. Um, improving or adding um, uh, mobile customer experience, 45%, uh, 45%, so that was really important. And then finally, you know, improving cross-channel customer experience. So something that, you know, you might be starting to hear as agents, the omni-channel experience. So, um, you know, you, you're going to have a consistent, seamless experience regardless of what touch point that you choose to interact with your agent or your carrier. It might be a mobile device, it might be social media, it might be the phone, it might be, you know, whatever, walking into your, your to your agency office. What's on the bottom here? Um, you know, improving the IVR experience, you know, that does yield a lot of frustration, so, you know, that's only about a quarter. Um, creating a dedicated customer experience group, and 23% said that that's what they were doing, and that might seem low, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, a lot of these dedicated uh, customer experience groups have been created already in carriers, um, so they've you know they've had legs. They, I wouldn't call them long in the tooth yet, but you know there's you know there's you know a five or six year history from for customer experience teams within most carriers. 23% um, said I'm all about improving the store experience. So what might be happening with our captive agents? And then <clears throat> about the same amount said you know I'm going to use communities and social computing. So I'm going to go out to the power of the crowd and really kind of understand. Um, the needs of my customers by, uh, uh, you know, building a community, a community around, uh, you know, a, a certain topic or, or something like that. Um, and of course, you know, for you guys, and this came from, you know, our, our, our uh, the, the survey that we did last year, <coughs> uh, customer experience is a leading priority for you as well. So um, the first two things, uh, retaining our existing book of business, acquiring new customers for you guys, this is like asking a question like, do you like breathing? Of course we like breathing. This is the whole reason why you exist, is to, uh, you know, ac acquire and retain customers. So those are the two top um, business objectives for, uh, you know, the, the coming year. Improving customer experience for agents, uh, that was also really important. So that ranked in number three. So, you know, moving, you know, taking away the breathing one, you know, I'd like to say that, it, you know, customer experience is, you know, a, a, a top initiative for <coughs> uh, agents as well. Um, what was at the bottom? Um, you know, uh, at least in our population last year, you know, no one was thinking about shuttering the agent, selling off the book, even though this is a very appealing investment right now for the private equity market. Um, you know, you know, uh, either increasing or reducing the number of uh, locations, you know, that also wasn't such a big deal. And <clears throat> and then, um, you know, even though it, you know, does, I'm sure, cause an, uh, an undue amount of stress for all of you guys and your CSRs, Consolidating business among fewer carriers, yeah, about two point, you know, uh, that got a 2.6 on our, our our one to five importance range. So it was below neutral. So um, you know, you know, not such a great one. And of course, all of this stuff is translating into the digital projects that you guys are doing. So when we asked <coughs> uh, agency uh, CIOs producers, owners, you know, what were the top tech initiatives that were going to be um, uh, priorities for them in the coming year. Lead generation, of course, you know, when you think about the breathing stuff, you know, that's really, really important. You know, we want to have leads that are, are valuable, they're warm, they're qualified. You know, we like getting from them from our carrier partners, but, you know, if they're, if they're cold, then, you know, I don't want to devote any time to, you know, to these on the, on, on the part of my producers if this is not going to turn into business. <clears throat> um, and we're going to be exploring this in the survey this year. Um, implementing or expanding digital marketing strategies. That was, you know, again, you know, marketing drives, creates demand, and that drives leads. So that, you know, these two are a good one-two punch. Um, what we're going to be looking at this year is really not just what is, you know, that you're doing this, but what are the initiatives, uh, sub-initiatives that are kind of fueling this, and how are these getting funded? No surprise, social media. You know, if, uh, and again, in, for many agencies, this is all about building brand recognition in our community, <coughs> pushing out a helpful information to um, our customers and prospects about coming weather events or even, you know, um, you know social good things that we're doing. Um, uh, bridging. You know, better connection, um, you, know, um, you know, from our broker systems or our agent systems 
to those of the our carrier partners you know more than half said that that was something they were going to be investing in and then I want to really point out you know a couple of other things so mobile um, is a huge thing so I'm going to implement or expand mobile capabilities so 37% said I'm going to expand those 40% <coughs> said I'm going to um, implement them um, uh, and the other thing is business analytics. So, you know, there's, uh, and the only reason I know this is because I'm writing a report around um, data and analytics and insurance. And uh, compared to other industries, we just are sitting on a mother load of data <coughs> about risks, about claims, about customer driving behavior, and all kinds of stuff that we've either acquired ourselves or, you know, we can get through partners or the DMV or whatever it happens to be. So even you as agents are trying to understand how you can make better business decisions um, based on all the data that you guys have have at your possession and believe me the carriers would like to have access to that as well so um, you know analytics top priority for both carriers and agents so I was kind of excited to see that last year <coughs> and um, just to give you an idea, in our population last year, and I hopefully it will increase, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we're hoping to capture this on an ongoing basis, is how much did everybody spend on tech last year? So 77% of our population spent 50000 or less on technology in 24, 2014, but 52% planned on expand, ex increasing that tech spend in 2015. So again, it goes back to the point where, you know, to succeed in the age of the customer, we have to win invest in digital and you know as we saw here um, more than half of our agencies last year said you know we're going to be increasing our tech spending so you know it may very well be on a mobile initiative it may be on a business analytics initiative whatever it happens to be so I want to call out a danger sign here so hang on let me go back here um, for the drama <coughs> um, in case you hadn't caught wind of it um, we are being disintermediated we talked a little bit about the fact earlier on that not many consumers actually buy insurance through an aggregator or an online agency or you know a, a, you know a site like compare.com or whatever it happens to be <clears throat> but you are in fact you know they are not hardly the only risk that you guys are facing so um, you know banks payment networks uh, wealth managers insurance companies they're all getting upset and turn you know and their their world are getting tumbled down because of a whole bunch of interesting digital disruptors that are delivering capital to them that are helping them move money you know consumers move money around providing um, investment advice even insurance advice and new ways to acquire risk protection the very stuff that all of you guys depend on to sell so um, you know these digital disruptors are able to do this for lower cost per, per package this up in ways that consumers want to buy think sharing economy we'll give you some examples of those in a moment so um, you know there's a whole bunch of new companies now this is definitely different than it used to be <clears throat> and they want to eat our lunch and a lot of this is being driven by data uh, to drive different kinds of strategic alliances. So imagine, and some of you might have caught this, BMW is now packing, packaging insurance with the sale of some of their high-end electric vehicles. They're hardly the only ones. Um, you know, if any of you who get on a withing scale in the morning, um, you know, you can share that information with OXA Insurance. Um, you know, OXA, you know, OCTO, you know, those little handy dongles that plug into your vehicles to uh, provide telematics insurance <coughs> is certainly, of course, sharing information with uh, carriers, have partners there, um, automotive manufacturers, things like that. So if you ha a look here and see all the interconnections between insurance companies, devices, and vehicle manufacturers, um, applications in the marketplace, as I said, like Octo and MyFitnessPal, the mobile operators. I mean, we are seeing insurance companies become mobile virtual network operators. Why? Because you know, in the age of the customer, for us to meet the needs of them, we have to be able to be connected. And finally, um, and this is one's a bit scary. You know, the internet firms or platforms. So think Facebook, LinkedIn, which of course you saw maybe maybe saw uh, day before yesterday was acquired by Microsoft, um, Apple, Google, and we think about the amount of time that consumers spend on uh, you know Facebook and and Apple versus on an insurance company website you can imagine 
you know, what that means for the future in terms of how we're going to be engaging with our insurance companies. And one of my colleagues wrote a great report about, uh, you know, about this role of these um, the, these platform plays like, uh, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, uh, you know, in the future and, and what that means for the insurance industry. Um, and of course, you know, we're seeing all these interesting startups. I talked a little bit about some of them. Some of these may be names that you recognize. So we see four social insurance or peer-to-peer -peer insurance. Think about this as a return to the Lloyd's model. Um, you know, people on a cul-de-sac, people on a block, you know, in Stafford, Connecticut decide, uh, you know, we're not going to buy insurance from Allstate or Hartford or Travelers. We're going to get together and we're going to insure our own block. Um, so you have, if you haven't caught these guys, Lemonade, very interesting company. And what they're basically doing is, you know, the risk pool on the block or the cul-de-sac ensures the low value risk. So the bicycle that gets stolen off the front porch or the mailbox that gets plowed down by the snowplow, <coughs> the big risks, they buy reinsurance. Um, but they're hardly the only ones. Uh, you know, we've got Innspeer and Common Easy and Innspool. You know, most of these are overseas. And we are going to be watching these carefully um, because up until Lemonade came along, we didn't think they had the capital structure to be able to support, uh, you know, uh, uh, being there for the, you know, for in, in big claim time. But you know, thank you reinsurance and the fact that Lemonade is, you know, um, Ace and AIG um, um, folks that are kind of uh, leading the leadership team there, <coughs> they get the business of insurance. Also, digital insurance brokers. So c companies like Policy Genius, um, very interesting company. I've interviewed them for the. Uh, vision report for my digital insurance playbook, um, but you know, do a fantastic job um, doing the thing that young people want to go and talk to you guys about. Explain the business of insurance. So, um, if you haven't checked out Policy Genius's blog, they have fantastic information about all kinds of things about risk and presented in a really nice, simple to understand, compelling way. Knip, uh, same kind of thing in, in uh, um, Switzerland. Uh, you know, other companies, telematics insurance companies, so many of you may be familiar with MetroMile, which is really the true usage-based auto insurance. You pay just for basically what you drive, uh, but there's many other companies, you know, in the space, Coverbox, Drive Like a Girl, um, uh, Woos, Marmalade, <coughs> most of these are APAC and, um, and, and the UK. And then finally, there's a very interesting trend. We'll talk a little bit about this. On-demand insurance. So why buy insurance when you don't need it, when you're not driving the car, when it's sitting in the garage, things like that, when maybe no one's in the house. And uh, we'll look at a few examples here, but Kuva, Shure, Trove, um, App Sheeran, uh, you know, are just some examples. So interesting companies coming at an interesting time. I also talked about the fact that, <clears throat> you know, consumers are being disintermediated and we're hardly the only um, industry that's in that same kind of boat but when you think about the things that are important to our customers their cars their homes their health their wealth there's a whole ecosystem of potential insurance distributors that surround them so you know here's just an example for our home we've got home maintenance companies mortgage firms HELOC firms the electric utilities uh, the lender that provided the mortgage uh, real estate agents you know is it, a whole ecosystem uh, you know of, of different kind of stakes in that home that could help the consumer and guess what consumers are willing <coughs> to contemplate buying from some of these firms we've done the same thing for vehicles as well and we did ask a question a couple of years ago uh, based on this graphic of, con of uh, about 5,000 US consumers and what we learned <coughs> they were most likely to want to buy insurance from their mortgage companies um, then it was Amazon and then it started to get interesting you started to see things like my internet service provider my electric company um, down at the bottom was Walmart but uh, you know consumers are, are open if the price is right, if they can understand it, if it's more convenient for them to buy insurance from these other kinds of companies. So um, unless we think that, uh, you know, it isn't just, it's just the disruptors that uh, are appealing to uh, um, our customers, it's, it's a lot of different stakeholders. And hurdles for distribution are falling fast. You know, 
Casco, um, based in Germany, <clears throat> basically an insurance distributor in a box. So insurance is a service. So you know, some of you may have a farm stand at the end of your driveway at the, uh, you know, in the summertime. You know, so along with your tomatoes and strawberries that you're trying to sell with people on your block, you could sell insurance. So um, you know, you know, definitely catching people's attention. Uh, you know, here I talked a little bit about lemonade already. Um, you know, here are the two founders. I've not yet gotten them to talk to me yet. They say they're not quite ready to come out of the closet to talk to an analyst at least, but uh, hopefully soon. <clears throat> I mentioned Insurify. Um, take a picture of your license plate and get a car insurance quote. So I, um, I went through this whole process for my trends report this year and, and I was so excited because I think I was going to be able to get quotes from 89 different car insurers. Well, I got three, um, two of whom I never heard of um, and uh, I think Safeco was the one that I actually had heard of. I was excited to see that MetLife was one of my options because I'm a MetLife life insurance customer. But the system is not smart enough to know that if you've got existing customers, don't you think you want to prioritize those for quotes for auto insurance? So a failure of the system that an agent wouldn't make. Um, My Life Protected, I don't know if you guys know these guys. They're associated with Next Gen Insurance, an agency here in, in Boston. And they have an interesting, um, basically, uh, an affinity distribution offering and um, you know they have a number of affinity partners including AOL um, and you know when I bring up AOL to a lot of people they say well you know that's like for old people yeah it might be but who owns AOL Verizon so could you imagine Verizon maybe kind of taking some lessons, you know, from AOL about maybe we could sell insurance because guess what, we're already, um, you know, providing bandwidth to the vehicle for a usage-based car insurance policy. We already have a car solution called Hum. Why wouldn't Verizon want to sell insurance? Why wouldn't Snapchat want to sell insurance? So we see some interesting new distributor partners. So um, again, here's our here's uh, Next Gen's offering for AOL My Life Protected. <coughs> Crudo, I talked a little bit about these guys. See their uh, social insurer in the Netherlands, <coughs> and you know you basically um, you know are using your Facebook login you know as your login for your insurance interactions. <coughs> so we're seeing more more of this kind of stuff. Talked a little bit about Kuva. And this is one of those on-demand insurance models. So, you know, hourly car cover, you kind of pick the amount of time and the kind of coverage that you want you want the car to be covered. It verifies the coverage. Of course, this is all on your mobile phone. You register the car <coughs> and then, you know, you submit your payment. Yeah, you know, all on your mobile device. And, you know, it's it's kind of ticking like that little parking pass that you have on your mobile phone when you park in the city now. And uh, you know, incredibly simple. And you might think, oh, this is the UK and I don't have to worry about that. Wrong. We have versions of that here in the U.S. as well. Um, that if they're not, you know, coming soon. Um, Trove, and they partnered. Not only partnered, but SunCorp is investing in them. Think about this as renters insurance. Uh, you know, it really actually basically is an extended warranty program. Um, but you could think about it as contents insurance. So. You know, you basically buy something, you add it to your trove. These guys did start off as a home contents inventory application. <coughs> um, you start keeping track of all the stuff you own. Would that be really handy, you know, to make sure you've got the right amount of renters coverage? And then you could do stuff like, as, as they show here, insuring them, sharing them, even liquidating them. You know, maybe if you're an eBay, you know, um, uh, um, a customer or you know you're you're on eBay you know you could you know, actually you know um, put your eBay stuff on or and dispose of it as well so think about this um, what does Google not know about us they know where we live they know because of their aerial imagery stuff they know the roof dimensions of our house they know because of Google Street View kind of the elevation so they know a lot about our houses already the only thing Google doesn't know is what's in our sock drawers so this would be a great way you know for Google to acquire a company <clears throat> or maybe in, even invest in the company to understand what's in all of our sock drawers um, so imagine the power of that Slice is on demand. Okay, so you know you could might discount 
trove because it's just your stuff and it's really kind of extended warranty. Slice is a little bit different. These guys are also, um, you know, coming out of the closet. They should be, uh, you know, live and in action. They've got 40 state licenses right now, expect to be in all 50 states by the end of the year. <clears throat> um, on demand per use insurance. So think about the sharing economy. And that's really kind of what they're aiming at is, you know, if you're an Uber driver or an Airbnb um, um, household, you know, you there are times when you're a commercial entity and there are times you're a personal entity and so they're aiming to take, uh, kind of take care of that but their platform is also going to be able to you know make it possible for consumers to do a Kuva like model I only want three hours worth of car insurance I only want X number of hours of homeowners insurance or you know I'm only going up to my weekend place for the weekend you know I'm going to do something different while I'm there for the weekend with slice <coughs> and then I'll buy I'll have a different kind of coverage when no one's occupying the second home so um, you know lest we think it's not happening in the US it sure is um, Broly. Now this is going to seem a little weird but in a market where you know you're buying all your stuff from um, <coughs> an aggregator what don't you have? You don't have an agent, right? Um, so now they've kind of rolled out this interesting personal insurance concierge. Doesn't that sound really great? That's, I hate to say it sounds better than an agent. So a personal insurance concierge to you know kind of help you um, you know get the right kind of coverage and you know be sure you have enough. And so you know it, it's kind of like uh, you know what goes around comes around. So you know now when a, you know a a way that consumers can buy services <clears throat> to you know that basically has historically been provided by the agent so um, I'm sure you guys have paid close attention to benefits they got slapped around last year because got it they were selling insurance without a license in California um, so you know paying a lot more attention to the seriousness uh, and that's certainly one of the things we see with the disruptors um, regulation is pretty darn serious and that might have been enough to drive Google to kind of um, uh, go into hibernation and rethink what they're doing um, but certainly they are changing how small businesses <coughs> are buying benefits as is freelancers union which is basically providing an affinity channel for the gig economy so you know if you've got you know three different jobs one is an uber driver one is a you know as a task rabbit and one is a you know a barista at, at Starbucks which is you know appealing for a lot of um, uh, younger people um, you still have to have insurance right so you know here's a way you could actually get it so um, you know Again, this whole idea of community sharing, uh, you know, business opportunities and uh, uh, between them, but you know, also providing access to an insurance, an experience that's going to be pretty compelling. UK, um, and again, we think it's you know maybe oh, it's just personal lines. No, it's small business insurance too. So you know, as we look at uh, the threat to our um, book of business because of self-driving cars, a lot of us are thinking as agents, gosh, I'll just focus on my you know my commercial coverage, my specialty coverage, my small business coverage. Holy moly, you know, it's not just Hiscox here in the U.S. It's not just a sure start. <laughs> <laughs> We've got digital risk in the UK that wants to do a sharing economy model, uh, subscription-based insurance for my small business. So, um, you know, again, new ways of thinking about traditional insurance that, um, you know, are going to upset things for us. So, uh, you know, if you haven't gotten the idea that change is ahead, um, you know, this will give you a little more am ammunition here. Um, this came from you guys. Technology is going to transform the business of insurance. Very optimistic. 87% of you said, uh, you know, that's the case. Um, a great recognition that our jobs in 2025, 10 years, or well, nine years from now, are going to be very different than they are today. Seven, you know, three quarters of our respondents said that. Um, it's going to be, as, as we've kind of highlighted here, we've seen examples of the way that new non-insurance competitors are going to come in, eat, you know, in, eat, uh, you know, come in and try and eat our lunch. Um, and then again, because I think this is a fairly optimistic, you know, uh, a little bit less than a third said, you know, we're a little bit of trouble here. And that may be because of something very specific about their own agencies. Maybe they hadn't caught up. Maybe they hadn't invested in analytics. Maybe they hadn't invested in a mobile app for their customers. Maybe they weren't doing Apple Pay <coughs> in the office. So these are all the things that are influencing what customers expect from us kind of moving forward. What we're clearly seeing that um, agencies are investing in. But if you're late to the game when it comes to digital, you know, I could absolutely understand why someone might say, 
the future of the agency distribution model is in peril. Um, and so obviously we talked a little bit about um, you know technology and what consumers are doing and guess what that's also going to impact the way consumers find you um, you know I don't know enough about you know all of you guys that are on the on the call but tinder you know the hookup app the dating app however you want to characterize it one of the things that's so appealing about tinder is it has a lovely browsing capability so you're just swiping over potential dates uh, and of course it's all location specific and stuff like that and um, can you imagine this actually being an agent locator experience guess what I have two uh, care customers that are developing this right now I have another one that's actually going to give a personality test to the consumer so you know not only am I going to you know build an agent locator as an insurer that's going to talk about you know my agents language skills the proximity from the customer kind of going back to the location stuff I talked about I'm going to be able to match that agent with the with the consumer and that agent's probably going to be the one that's going to be the best fit um, to listen to them to close that business and he or she is going to be a better experience for that consumer if I administer this personality test so match.com think about that or eHarmony eHarmony is a better idea um, and you know kind of to the point I made about does my agent you know if I'm a young person and I'm living La Vida mobile um, does my agent have a mobile um, app um, or a mobile optimized website whatever it happens to be I can also imagine that you know we're going to be looking at just how tech savvy you guys are as agencies uh, in terms of the consumers ability to filter on that um, and this yes Premier Blue Cross Blue Shield is you know is a health insurer in Washington State but and it's a little hard to see um, is but in this red box here you could actually filter on um, how tech savvy the service pro provider is you know so does this hospital have electronic medical records so on and so forth so wait for it it's going to be coming to you guys as well so you can imagine that the kinds of um, digital capabilities that you guys are offering your customers um, are going to be some of the things that carriers are going to be actually uh, trying to identify and put put forth <coughs> to our to our shared customers so a lot of disruption going on lots of crazy things going on you know uh, uh, car insurance as we know it is going away thank you self-driving vehicles a lot of competition uh, you know coming from uh, you know uh, going after the homeowner space obviously from you know banks and real estate companies that I talked about you know all these new hot startups coming up that are attracting tons of VC money what do we do as insurance organizations how do we stay relevant how do we you know how do we um, act in the way that the consumer says you know my agent understands me and can predict my needs before I even kind of really know this likewise maybe the insurance company so don't think about this as big brother but more big mother I'm going to be I'm going to be helping my customers um, and you know if we can stay more engaged with our customers on a more regular basis outside of the bill you know bill pay or god forbid you know that stupid I hate to tell you that annual policy review is just the stupidest thing I've ever seen no one does it and I really you know when it when it comes in I have time for this <coughs> what do we do insurance it's an arm's length thing right we buy it we get it to put the car on the road to get the mortgage binder for the you know when we have to go for our closings whatever it happens to be so you know we don't have a ton of engagement with our insurance companies outside of getting a bill not pleasant and having purchased it um, or God forbid a claim also not pleasant <clears throat> how do we make insurance enjoyable how about doing things like I talked a little bit about uh, you know a, a driving app for my insurance company that's not about chiding me and coaching me on safe driving because you know basically when I'm trying to get to work I'm kind of not thinking that way I'm thinking about getting to work so how about helping me in trip planning how about helping me in trip planning that might also include my trip to the airport my trip in the airport <coughs> my trip at my destination from my insurance company 
Um, and of course, things like, did the kids get home from school? Are mom and dad, elderly parents, still living independently? Are they, is there something going on that we should pay attention to? <clears throat> so this is kind of where we see things like the Internet of Things coming into play here. And of course, the stuff we've always done as insurance organizations, so the crucial stuff that delivers comfort and peace of mind. I've got an insurance coverage. You know, I know that my insurance carrier is going to take care of me when I have a claim. My agent is going to help me navigate those processes. So. <clears throat> things that you know kind of protect my digital self you know preserve the um you know the identities of my family and my children and you know keep my security the security and, and the privacy of my my information about me and my family safe uh and of course the standard stuff is the door locked are the appliance turned off? Can I check and verify that? Can I just let certain people in the house? I know you're probably seeing the Ring ad on television right now where you can actually see who's ringing your doorbell and answer it even though you might be thousands of miles away. So, um, you know, <clears throat> we're moving into a new world here. And that new world is services. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we probed on this last year in the Future of the Agent um, surveys and interviews that we did and a lot of people said, yeah, that's an idea. We're going to move in. This is going to way we're going to be relevant. We're going to fend off the competition and, you know, it's not going to be about on-demand insurance. We're going to add more to the insurance experience besides the, you know, the underwritten policy. We're going to add services on top of that. And of course, the common one everyone talked about was, we want to be the Angie's list of insurance. And of course, you know, who has argued about that? Well, legal and compliance for any carrier. Guess what? IAG, Insurance Australia Group, one of the leading insurers in Australia, is now opening up its claims network to its customers. So if you need to find a contractor, you know, a plumber, electrician, you know, you know, the, you know, the framer, the tile guy, you know, for a home improvement project or a repair project, you know, IAG is going to let you use their already vetted contractors. Um, so, you know, think about IAG as becoming <clears throat> the vetted Angie's List. So it's not just a marketing channel for contractors. Um, back by the, I wouldn't call it back by the full faith and credit of IAG, but, you know, they're, you know these guys have already been uh, vetted by IAG for their claim services. And guess what? You guys are willing to sell this. Uh, most common one that agents want to sell, <clears throat> or let's put it this way, we're willing to sell. Um, cyber threat monitoring. You know, let's face it, we can't turn on the news or open the paper anymore without l reading about a, uh, you know, some kind of data breach. So 55% of agents said <coughs> I'd be willing to sell that. And it would be a nice compliment with my identity theft protection insurance that might be part of homeowners or renters. Uh, disaster planning services. Um, you know, we're having, seeing some interesting wildfires out west right now. You know, what could we do to actually help consumers prepare for that, either in terms terms of, you know, coastal properties or, you know, properties in the mountains or whatever that might be subject to wildfire. Home inspection services. You can read the list as easily as I can, but, uh, you know, there is appetite, <coughs> especially for, um, you know, things that are kind of top of mind for a lot of customers right now. Protect my home, protect something even more near and dear to me, my my very identity, um, and so agents really see an opportunity there. And what would convince them to to do so if they were on the fence, <clears throat> if it was already bundled with the insurance product, uh, and that would be up to the carrier to do. Uh, and you, but you could imagine them doing that. Um, give me a commission for just making a referral to one of these providers and then finally if there was someone in my local community you know you scratch my back I scratch yours as a as a local insurance agent you know we'll pass business back and forth that was also very appealing um, and we have to do this because you know our new you know, competitors are thinking differently so you know uh, this is a little text dense but as I've shown you, they're obsessing about delighting customers. You know, they're all because of their data analytics. They're out looking for the most next most immediate things that their consumers want, and looking to predict that. Um, they're also involving their customers in, you know, what do you want to do? I'm going to crowdsource. You know, maybe the name of the company, maybe the way we create the product, things like that. But even <coughs> traditional carriers are actually bringing their customers in on their innovation teams to help with product and service development. They're also thank you so social media relying on low cost referral marketing they're very software dependent uh, and they're all about let's take out manual processes let's make this straight through let's make this automated and if we do that we can reduce our costs um, 
and we can do it for less money than you know maybe Allstate or State Farm or Progressive or Geico could do. Um, they can move fast uh, to go after new opportunities. Why? Because a lot of them don't have core systems that you know were built in the 1960s or 70s. Um, so they can move fast. Their stuff is in the cloud, and you know they get access to all the new cool features that might be coming from the cloud service provider. And finally, and most importantly, they're willing to try and fail. Um, which brings us to an interesting try and fail. Google. Um, you know, March 6, 2015, March 23, 2016 was the life expectancy of Google um, Compare Auto. So, um, you know, Google had people taking actions, they don't come back, they made people think differently and generated new ideas and in insurance. Google provided permission for more and more of these disruptors to come into the marketplace because, God, if Google could do it, you know, so can I. Uh, and it certainly caught people's attention. So, um, a little deference to Arnold, they will be back. And this is why Google will be back. 3% of Americans, not, this is not even three months after the launch of Google Compare last year, 10,000 Americans that we surveyed, 3% had heard of it and used it. Um, I think I was a little bit, maybe 2% of that. 8% had heard of it and not used it. 39% um, I have not heard of it, but I would consider using it. And I'd make the argument that Google got out of the business too fast because, you know, if they waited a little bit longer with all the insurance, auto insurance shopping we were seeing because of uh, rate increases, uh, they could have picked it up. But um, I think, uh, you know, concern about, uh, you know, uh, uh, cannibalizing their AdWord business, uh, maybe the wrong guys there, maybe the regulatory environment was maybe more than they uh, could uh, uh, chew uh, what they bid off. But um, Google is all known for moonshots. So they took a try. They were willing to try and fail, <coughs> and they will be back. It will look different. In fact, it might look a little bit more like us. Um, so. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, kind of to sum it up, what we see the agent of the future being. Um, so today, you know, you're an agent. Tomorrow, you're going to be a risk counselor. Think about Brawley. You know, it's not just about taking an order for insurance. You're doing something more meaningful for the customer. Well, you know, today we administer a lot of policies. You know, we're going to be freed up, thank you, uh, digital and software to do a lot more client advising, which is what they want. You know, we're not going to be selling insurance anymore. We're going to be facilitating. And that facilitation may mean. Um, connecting consumers with service providers that are going to enhance the insurance products that they're buying either through us or through other partners. Um, how much car insurance do you want? Well, who cares? Tell me more about your needs. What kind of needs do you have? So maybe you know a different kind of policy is going to make more sense for you. Maybe a slice or a trove or whoever the next one happens to be. But based on what I know about your needs, you know, I'm going to recommend the right kind of solution for you. Um, uh, again, you're going to be unchained from your desks. You know, you're going to be much more dependent on mobile devices. Maybe some of those will be strapped to your wrist. Maybe when Google comes back with Google Glass in a different form that works better, maybe you'd get to experience that. <clears throat> um, and of course, many agents, you know, many agents who are 59, 56, average age for a, a life insurance agent right now, 59 years old. Old, 56 for a uh, uh, PNC. Um, so we have this great brain drain that uh, we're looking at in the not too distant future, and it's very hard to find young guys like Chris Paradiso who's stepping in to, and, and finds the business of insurance exciting enough to want to invest and do stuff like this and hire young people to do the same thing. So <clears throat> some of the stuff that we've historically done as agents that maybe have not been very satisfying to um, to people, uh, maybe uh, you know, is going to go away. And we're going to be freed up to do the things that we really like to do, take care of our customers. So fewer agents. Um, and again, I just published two pieces on what drives agent loyalty with carriers and then a piece about um, uh, how you reward agent loyalty. And those rewards um, may look very, very different. 
So if you are paying attention to what's going on with the DOL fiduciary rule and what the impact that is on financial advisors and acting in the consumer's best interests and how it's affecting their compensation, and if you didn't catch uh, John Oliver and his interesting little thing about retirement savings recently, you probably should pay attention to it. But um, this focus on compensation for financial advice, maybe it even goes into insurance advice, uh, thank you DOL fiduciary rule, is going to reverberate into greater parts of our market so you know um, maybe how we get compensated is going to change too um, and certainly who's going to be paying attention to that is you know what's going to be happening in the presidential election so um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how any of you guys feel you know is it a coronation is it you know let's make America great again is it the decline of Western civilization all I can say is is that <clears throat> when someone said we want something different I think the good Lord overreacted so um, that's everything I have for today. You know, I went over just a tad. Uh, we have about tw you know a few minutes left for Q and A, but um, you know, I let me open up my my uh, chat window here and see if anybody has any questions <coughs> that they'd like to ask. Oh, I see. I do have a few. Let me see if I can see what they are. No, someone's talking about my mic. So, any questions anybody has? I think your lines can be unmuted. You can go ahead and ask, or you can send me a chat. Is this a shy audience? Kind of sure sounds that way. So, um, you know, I'll, I will let you guys get to lunch or coffee or, you know, a walk outside in this lovely New England air if, if that's where you guys are. Ellen, but, you do have one question. Um, uh, one of the questions would, would you mind sending out the PowerPoint presentation um, okay. from Littleton? <laughs> And another one, will the slides be available from our good friend Lori Rowan? Oh, yeah, absolutely, Chris. I think, you know, anybody, you know, I think Joe could probably go ahead and distribute those. But if anybody wants copies of the slides, um, you're more than happy to, you know, we'd love to, love to put them in your hands. Um, one other final did, plug. And also, did you want to just share about um, what Forrester has for a technology conference? Um, oh, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, because uh, there are a lot of people that would especially in the insurance, uh, independent insurance world would benefit by um, heading to New York and Ellen maybe you could give the details. Sure. Next week in New York, um, and this is like what, something that Forrester is really known for, we have our customer experience forum. It's at the Midtown Hilton um, on, I think it's 6th Avenue up near Rockefeller Center. <clears throat> and uh, our customer experience forum is about 2,000 passionate people about customer experience ton of insurance companies. Chris, I think you're going to be there. I'm going to be there. Um, but it is just a tremendous amount of energy about how we can better meet the needs of our customers and as a result of doing that, improve our own businesses. So um, it lasts two days. It's next Wednesday, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, um, Manhattan. Um, and you know, if anybody's interested, um, you can take a look at Forrester's website and just search on customer experience form, or maybe even Google it, um, and it should pop up for, uh, as I said, next week. But tons of energy, and thanks, Chris. I think I'm going to see you there. But uh, uh, it is a just, you know. Tons of energy, tons of press about it, and uh, you know you'll learn some really interesting things about. Yes, indeed, there is a financial impact on delivering great customer experience. And then one final plug for Ellen Carney. I have uh, my next agency survey is going to be launched a little bit later on this summer. Focus of it is going to be on the agent experience. How you feel about the carrier partners you work with by name. It's of course all anonymous for you guys, but we're going to be actually looking at you know. Um, ease of doing business, effectiveness of the interactions, and how working with them makes you feel. Do you feel frustrated? Do you feel satisfied? Do you feel accomplished? So emotion is probably one of the biggest factors in customer experience, and we're going to be looking to understand your emotions around working with carrier partners. We're also going to be looking at how they onboard you. As I said, um, investments in technology and uh, deep dive into digital marketing specific initiatives and a few other things that might pop up. But um, you know, Chris will uh, may, uh, may be prevailing on you to uh, see if you might be willing to you know, fill out my survey. But um, you know, that will be We will absolutely in. push that <laughs> and I think it's hugely, in help, it's hugely helpful that us agents understand that we need to have these surveys filled out. 
um, you share this data, you share this information, and it's very important that that the carriers find out how we feel on how we're being treated. Oh, yeah. and, right. and they're getting that from you if we just make sure we can spread the word. Um, any IAOA members or PIA or Big I members, if we could get as many people uh, involved that we fill these surveys out, they're absolutely critical to our industry. Uh, we thank you, Ellen, for, for all of that. We do have a question. Um, sure. The question is coming from Mike Demko. Uh, slide number 18. You mentioned 55% okay. of consumers contact their agent for clarification of coverages. How do you see you video get? playing a role in that oh, area? Oh, that's a good one. Um, Very I good question, talk, Michael. It's, it's an awesome question. And um, in this virtual world that we could live in, can you imagine... Um, uh, you know, not actually having to go down to the office, but actually picking up the mobile phone and actually having a, a, a video chat session with my insurance agent. Um, USAA is doing that already. There's a company in Manhattan, Cafe X, and there's a few others that are doing the same thing. Pitney Bowes is doing it as well. But you can initiate a video chat session with, um, uh, you know, a live video chat session with your agent or maybe even a field underwriter, um, <clears throat> you, know, if, uh, you know, if you're running commercial business to connect you. But I absolutely totally agree that's exactly what the direction is going to be. And this is a way that you can improve your productivity and, again, you know, being able to meet the customer customers needs anytime anywhere any device in their moment of need there's not going to be a you know a, there's a, there's not going to be time to actually walk into the office they're going to want to connect with you so video is totally agree with the direction there I would have to agree I think video is enormous um, great question Mike I know you're into the video field and uh, I hope more agents open their eyes and really see the value and how powerful YouTube is as the second most used area. Yep. Yep. Um, so I think it's. I think. I just think and hope that agencies see that they need to be in the video world, um, and there are very inexpensive areas such as your services to help agents um, who don't have and who don't have the ability um, to hire and do a lot of it in house. So yeah, I think I it's huge. Yeah, one thing I got to add, um, if if you've heard this name, Mary Meeker, Mary Meeker is the goddess of the internet, and every year she has a big presentation about internet trends. Um, and Mary's been around, you know, since the, again since the early '90s, but she she did her internet trends presentation two weeks ago, and she had a really interesting section to Mike's point about video. Um, you know, the next wave of, of customers isn't going to be the millennials. I talked about millennials 18 to 24 using their mobile devices to look for an insurance agent. Um, the, the Gen Zs, the next, you know, the, the wave following the millennials, they're all about, we don't text it, you know, millennials text. Um, Gen Z's pictures. So take a picture. You know the the camera. You know the camera capabilities of mobile phone important. Video even more important. So we if you know we got to prepare. Well, I wanted to thank you, Ellen. Thank you for all this awesome information and uh, and just stressing the importance of how the customer experience plays such an enormous role in our income today and. Um, I think more importantly, customer experience is all about our income for the future, uh, yep. for years to come. And uh, we can't thank you enough for all you do for the industry. You are absolutely one of our friends, and I hope all agents see that. Um, we cannot thank you enough for all the data and information you're sharing. And I can assure you we're going to um, pick your brain and definitely <laughs> have you back. And um, I also wanted to thank uh, GoInsuranceAgent.com. Um, they t they are our app provider. They also are um, behind helping us sponsor this, and um, we thank them. And um, if anybody's looking for the slides, they can email my, myself or Joe. My email is c paradiso at paradisoinsurance.com, and Joe is b s d e s t e t e y at paradisoinsurance.com. And um, Ellen's is up there. It's e c a r n e y at forrester .com. Um And make sure if you have any questions, reach out to her. She will get back to you. It's amazing how much uh, content that she has written about mobile, about video, and just 
just there's just a tremendous amount of content that's out there and I would highly recommend you to reach out to her absolutely a, a great advocate for our industry thank you everybody and we will be in touch with everybody when our next uh, webinar is going to be and what content it's going to be on thank you Alan thanks Chris